Let's just join together and pray. Father, as we come near to the end of this lovely day, we are so full of thankfulness for your wonderful grace to us and your abundance of good gifts so richly bestowed on us. Forgive us, Lord, that so often we take for granted your goodness to us. Lord, we want to thank you for our families. And we want at this time, Lord, to lift up to you those who are going through difficult family times. We just pray that you will draw near to them and help them through these difficulties. We pray, Lord, for our friends who are fasting for Ramadan. We do pray, Lord, that they may be more responsive to talk of you. May their eyes be opened, Lord. It grieves us to see them so chained to works and rituals and yet no, have no hope for eternity. Help us, Lord, to draw close to them and be bold in our conversations with them. Lord, we pray for our church leaders that you will equip them for the work you've called them to do. May they consistently look to you and not become weighed down by the responsibilities of this calling. And may we as a fellowship support them. Father, we now ask that our hearts and minds may be quietened to the things around us, and may we concentrate on your word and be open to respond. And we pray that you'll be with Simon as he brings your word to us tonight. Amen. Our reading is Hebrews chapter 11, 1 to 23. I'm glad it's not to the end because there's some big words. <laughs> now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that place was called Tephira because fire from the Lord had burned among them. The rabble with them began to crave other food and again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it into a hand mill or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into loaves and it tasted like something made with olive oil. When the Jews settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you, that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms? as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promise on oath to their ancestors. Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all those people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me if I have found favor in your eyes, 
and do not let me face my own ruin. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed, if only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, Here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. We're at the second point of our series in numbers crunching and... Uh, a cure for the discontent, which is exactly what they'd become. Uh, if you remember, we said last week that um, just before God gave the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 1, he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In other words, in gratitude and adoration and awe of what I've done, now live like this. And then he tells them how to live. And if they live for him, he has plans to harm them. <laughs> he has plans not to harm them, but to prosper them and to give them hope and a future. So they were to move on out and head for the promised land. That's what Numbers is about. It wasn't supposed to take them years. They weren't supposed to wander around in the desert getting nowhere fast. But that's exactly what happened. Numbers tells us about their journey to the promised land for 38 long years because of their whinging and their moaning. But Israel get off to a brilliant start. The first 10 chapters are a joy to behold in terms of their response to the Lord. God, through Moses, begins to assemble the people in their families and their clans and their ranks and their numbers. But what's he really doing? He's arranging them into a mighty army. Leaving Mount Sinai, Israel marches forward with the Lord at the head. Why? To establish God's kingdom in the promised land, right in the middle of all the other nations. It's obviously a picture of God's saved people, just been brought out of Egypt, in sync with their saviour, with a mission to establish his kingdom on the earth. That's what they were about. And that mission, although altered somewhat, hasn't changed. If you've been freed from the control of the God of this world, and you've swapped the kingdom of darkness for the kingdom of life, and you've moved from Satan to God, then that's your mission too. Marching forward with other Christians. Following behind Jesus, Jesus at the front, to be engaged in the battle of living this life, but also bringing more and more people into his kingdom. I wonder, is that you here this evening? And do you see this world as a battleground and not a playground where we get all too comfortable and just enjoy all the fun? 
Are you in sync with the King of Kings, moving when he moves, advancing into unreached territory to spread the good news of freedom from sin and Satan and the lies of this world and how much lies there is out there, especially at the moment? If you're a Christian here this evening, you have a compelling reason to actually get up in the morning, to serve your Saviour. That's what it's ultimately about, in living for Him, in, in fighting the battle He's given you with His tools, and in reaching out to others. So look up in the morning and tool, tool up, and don't see it automatically think, now what fun can I have today? You have to get a bit seriouser, if that's a word. You... you it's not that you can't have fun, but we are in a battle. There's a battle for the mind, there's a battle for the soul. Like a faithful soldier, as Israel were doing at the beginning, obey your captain's orders. 2 Timothy 2.3 tells us, endure hardship with us, all together, like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs because he wants to please his commanding officer. Israel starts off brilliantly. Moses, Aaron and the people obeyed the Lord for those first ten chapters. Numbers 2.34 says, So the Israelites did everything the Lord commanded Moses. That is the way they encamped under their standards and that is the way they set out each with his clan and family. Then 5 verse 4 and 9.23 also tells about Moses, Aaron and everyone else obeying. It was a great time, those first 10 chapters. All was well, off they go, full of joy, anticipation, faith, fellowship and victory. You get that picture, uh, Numbers 10.33. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord, that Sinai, and travelled for three days... The ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them, in other words, in front of them. The Lord was at the front during those three days to find them a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. The Lord's presence, therefore, was with them, guiding, protecting, and blessing them. And then in verse 35, it says, Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered. May your, fees, may your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. There's victory, there's expectation, there's anticipation, there's faith, there's joy, there's fellowship. It's a picture almost of when you first get... So they've just been saved, remember, from Egypt. It's when you first get saved and you start walking with the Lord and His people. Before you knew the Lord, you wanted to be... A, before I knew the Lord, I wanted to be with others like me. That's where I felt at home. That's where I could be me. When I came to know the Lord, I wanted to be with others like me with those who had also come to know the Lord, because that's where I felt at home, and that's where I could be me. Where do you feel most at home? Here? Or with others who don't know the Lord? That's a telling indictment on your state of your soul, you know, the answer to that question. So the Israelites came together, and they camped together, and they marched together, and they fought together, and they loved it at first being with their own. They were a team. 600,000 of them, I think. You see, followers of Jesus want to be with others who follow. Makes sense. If you're following Jesus, that's where you want to be. Unless something's going wrong inside. And remember, when you first got saved, you were kind of at everything, weren't you? Or you wanted to be, at least. You wanted to be with your own. You wanted to be with your people. God's people are now your people. It was new. It was exciting. Ruth uh, 1 verse 16, which John uh, spoke briefly about this morning. Where you go, uh, Ruth said to Naomi, I will go. 
And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Is that how you feel as a Christian? Make the most of one another. These are your family. Now, the interesting fact as well is that had we not come to the Lord, most of us would never cross paths with many others that are sitting here today. I probably wouldn't know any of you. With the exception of a few addicts, maybe. You would avoid Christians. Or you'd be in church, but you weren't one of them. You might consider Christians to be oddballs, or God squad, or deluded, or maybe even hated their presence. I certainly did. I felt like a fish out of water when I was among Christians. I couldn't stand them. But now when you see Jesus, when you get saved, their God is your God. Their people are your people, and it's a wonderful thing. Do you still feel like that? Do you still see it like that? Would you rather be with other Christians than anyone else? Do you still desire to meet with the Lord and others at every opportunity? Or have things changed along the way in your heart? Well, here we have the people of God Israel starting off on their journey following the Lord. They're full of joy, faith, anticipation, excitement, and victory. Jesus is the king, or God is the king in this sense, and his presence goes with them. You know, it is true though, isn't it? There is a kind of honeymoon period when you first come to Christ. You kind of have, you get a new heart, and you get a new vision on life. You start seeing the world through God's eyes, and you get a new life, and you're walking in a different direction. You get a new destination, and you have a new power to do things you never be able to do before. The trouble is, like any new things, you and I can take them for granted, and the novelty can wear off. And inevitably, that newness will become more familiar. And we all started off well, didn't we, like these Israelites? But maybe over the time, over the years, you begin to lose touch with that desire and that awe and that wonder that you once had. I know I have sometimes. That certainly means that you have sometimes. And yet the fact of following Jesus and the excitement and the anticipation and the joy and the wonder and the victory, that truth is still, is still there. That's true when you follow Jesus. There's still all those things. But if you're in that state now, maybe you just need to rediscover the joy of what it truly is to know Jesus afresh. Psalmist David cried out, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to enjoy it, to be restored, and to sustain me. And then rest in it and walk in it. It's not about trying, it's about believing that truth and resting in it and moving on. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Where's our joy, friends? Some of you have it, I know. Perhaps others don't right now. So they got off to a brilliant start, didn't they? And then what happened? Israel started moaning. 1 verse 1, 11 verse 1. Now the people complain about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. When he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Only three days into their journey and they start moaning. I'm not sure what this first complaint was. It was, just sounds like it was a general whinging. You know how it is. We do it sometimes. And the Lord warns them by sending fire. But he's actually quite merciful because it only burns the outer fringes of the camp. But it annoys him because God has graciously provided for them and all they can do is find fault with his provision and they've only been three days in. And then we have 
the intercessor, which is always necessary. Verse 2, when the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. You see, without someone to stand in the gap between sinful us and the holy God, they would have been toast. That fire wouldn't have just remained in the outskirts of the camp. And Moses was that man of the moment. They cry out to him, he prays, the fire dies down. Moses, if you like, symbolically, averts the wrath of God that would otherwise be upon them. And you and I know that Moses ultimately pointed to one who is so much greater than Moses that we now know who the intercessor is, God in human flesh. One of God and one of us, the perfect intermediary, the absolute genius of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He now prays on our behalf. He is the one that stands in the gap. The cross removed the wrath of God against our sin permanently and completely because Jesus bore the wrath and he turned it away from all who trust in him. It's almost like this huge, fiery wrath of God is heading right towards you. Jesus gets in the way and just redirects it upon himself. But even better than that, for us now, and something really Moses could only ever dream of is that through Jesus, anyone who trusts in him, not just a prophet, not just an appointed person, They can stand boldly in the presence and look unashamedly into that burning holy eye and not be incinerated, but actually be glorified in Jesus. Can you grasp the fact that we have access, as Jesus has access to the Father, we now stand as he stands in the presence of God. Now that's extremely exciting, but it doesn't look like it, does it? Because we take these things for granted. Moses would have given his right arm to have what we have. We thank God for Moses. He saved the people from destruction. We thank God for Jesus, though, because he permanently and completely saves us from eternal destruction and gives us the boldness in the presence of God that he himself enjoys because we're coated in his righteousness. We have asbestos fireproof clothing that he has provided for us. So here's the complaint. And the complaint begins with, if only. How many times have you said that sometimes? I have. 11 verse 4. The rabble, I love the language in this, the rabble with them began to crave other food and again the Israelites started wailing, isn't that great? And said, if only we had meat to eat. Now God had provided this manna every day, kind of sweet wafer-like things, miraculously feeds the thousands upon thousands. Jesus fed the 4,000, the 5,000. God fed... I'm sure Jesus was involved, but any old Christ was involved. Um, He fed 600,000 with this. And every day. But you see, the year before, after crossing the Red Sea, so just done that incredible miracle, another brilliant miracle, outstanding miracle, the people moaned about it. And now God sends fire because they're here again and he's warning them, don't do or say what you did back at the Red Sea. Don't make the same mistake. But once the fire dies down, they're at it again. You know, some of us are natural moaners. Did you ever watch One Foot in the Grave, Victor Meldrew? (laughs) I don't believe it. Every time something didn't go right, he just, he threw his hands up and he was desperate and he thought, I don't believe it because things weren't going his way. He was a miserable so-and-so. He was a moaner. But the trouble is, discontent starts with, if only. Verse 4, the rabble with them began to crave other food. 
dissatisfaction in what God's giving. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Well, that makes your mouth water better than this manner, I expect. But that's not the point. See, what they're really doing here spiritually is they're looking at the godless past with rose-tinted glasses. They long to go back to Egypt because the food options were better. And the trouble is that kind of longing blinds them to the bad bits of the past. They forget because they're looking at food, they forget that they were slaves, they were worked to death, they were under the rule of a psychopathic dictator. Their life was a horrible life, they hated it and they longed for a delivered to get them out. And now they want to go back and they're kind of thinking, well, at least we'll get the melons and fish. It wasn't that bad. That sounds silly to us, but they've lost their focus. I wonder if you've ever done that. And you've looked back to what you think are the good old days. And there were some bits of the past which may have been better, fair enough, but, but actually very few in reality. My wife still says I lived and I taught like I'm in the 80s. I haven't moved on 30-odd years. It's interesting that Solomon says, Ecclesiastes 7.10, do not say why were the old days better than these. Now, I've said that a hundred times over, and older people say it all the time. And it says, for it is not wise to ask such questions. Israel, you see, why isn't it wise? Israel began to long for the days back in slavery without God. Wow. I wonder if you've ever done that. You've been saved, but you look back at before, and you long for certain things or certain people, and you wish you could still have this, or you could still do that. It's like the drink, this is an extreme example, it's like the drinker who looks back at those drinking days through rose-tinted spectacles because his appetite becomes uh, swollen with it again and he thinks, that was the best fun I ever had because he's remembering it when he was a drinker. And then you forget it would have killed you if it hadn't been for, for the Lord taking you out of it. But you suddenly think, that wasn't so bad. Or maybe something else. You thought maybe back in that day, in the past, you had less trouble. But you know, the fact is, as life goes on, trouble is inevitable. Job says in Job 5, 7, Yet man is born to trouble as surely as the sparks fly upward. Much of the hardship you have now is common to everyone. There are some trials that believers have, but a lot of the stuff everybody gets. So wouldn't you rather face it with Jesus than without? They're prepared to forsake God and go back so it can have fish and melon. You see, these is, and this is the thought process, these Israelites focused on one aspect of Egypt that seemed better, probably the only aspect, and it blinded them to the horror of what they'd been saved from. And you and I need to remember often what we've been saved from. And if God had said at this stage, okay, then go back to Egypt and eat till your heart's content. Yeah, you can have the fish. Yeah, you can have the melons. They would have walked right back into slavery, abuse, and probably death. There would have been huge reprisals. They'd have put themselves back under the control of the evil tyrant Pharaoh after spending 470 years of their history trying to get out. It's madness. But when you lose your focus, that you can become like that. And the great thing is, and we'll see this more next week, God didn't say clear back off then, you ungrateful so-and-sos. He loved them too much to let them go. Isn't that right? Don't be taken up with kind of romantic thoughts about your life before Jesus. Don't fix on one thing and start longing for it and saying, if 
only. In fact, when you begin to do that, remind yourself of the horror of a life without Jesus. Remind yourself of when, when the grave was opening up wide or when you came to that crossroads and you knew that Jesus was the truth and you knew that he'd taken away your sin and you could choose at that point to still walk the opposite way and carry on what we were doing or to be saved by him. But at that point, the distinction was crystal clear. And now it's not so much. <coughs> Remind yourself where you'd be now without Jesus. You would, as the Bible says, lost and without hope in this. You'd still be in this world, but you would be lost and without hope. And you would be incinerated in the end eternally. That's where you'd be heading. And imagine whose control you would be under if you'd never come to Jesus. You'd be still, unwittingly perhaps, under the, greatest, the control of the greatest serial-killing psychopath the universe has ever known. The one who loves and smiles and inspires pedophile killers. That's how sick he is. He is the author of all evil. He's the father of lies. He loves what ISIS do. He loves what far-right groups do. He loves killing. He's a murderer from the beginning. That's Satan himself. That's who you are unwittingly under the slavery of. Do you really want to go back to that? Now your eyes have been opened. Also, obviously and logically, in your mind, you don't. But sometimes you get so carried away with the world, that's where you're heading. And you've got to stop and say, no, no more. And you know what? All this moaning kills joy. It kills joy. Where was the joy they had three days ago? Don't take long. It's very easy to put out your joy. And then, if only, very quickly brings discontent into the present, into your present experience. Verse 6, but now, because they've been thinking about Egypt and the food, but now we've lost our appetite, that is for the manna. We never see anything else but this manna. Why is it unwise to say the past or the old days were better than these? Because you start longing for what you had. And you start comparing and contrasting with others. And if you do that, you'll very quickly become dissatisfied with your, what you've got right now. Thoroughly dissatisfied. Manna may have become a bit mundane for them. In that sense, I understand. But in the context, they were in the desert. There was nothing else. And God graciously and miraculously provided more than enough sustenance to keep them going through a very difficult time. There's the context. It wasn't a question of, oh, let's have all this variety. Let's have a banquet in the desert. It was getting them through and getting them through more than enough in a difficult time. And, you know, when they first got manna, it blew their mind. They rejoiced in God's gracious provision. But now they're focusing on the past and, and others and what they've got back in Egypt. And they, so therefore, they become very quickly ungrateful and dissatisfied with what the Lord is giving them right now. You know, that's what happens when you see what others have got or you think you were better off before or you think you could be better off than you are now. You know, God promises to provide your material needs, but he never promises to provide your material wants. You can have as much blessing spiritually as your heart will fill, can take. But materially, he'll get you through. But he's never promised to give you the bonus ball materially. Not in the New Testament. And in this ungrateful age, it's been so much worse. And that is true. Because once... I saw this evolving over a period of years, and now it's become ridiculous. What was once wants, and everybody knew they were just wants, have now become needs. I need a new mobile. I need a bigger TV. I need the latest games console. I, I need an iPad. I want a laptop. No, no, not want, I need. <laughs> it's become a need. 
I, I need designer clothes. I need a label. Oh, I'm a hypocrite. Some of you know what this means. It was cheap and it was a present. Um, all these things are now seen as basic needs. They're not basic, but they're seen as what everyone should have and actually what I deserve. See, our culture, increasingly so, chases after bigger and better. And that's the measure of success in this ridiculous world. A good car, a big house, that's what people aim for, isn't it? If you don't have it, you're encouraged to get into debt until you do have it. So many of us, therefore, live way beyond our means to give the impression that we're doing materially well and therefore we're su living successful, happy lives. And it's all over Facebook about how wonderful my life is and aren't my kids lovely? And sometimes you know very well that their lives are not successful or happy. Plastic life. And you know the trouble is, when I go to Zambia, they've got nothing. They don't even know whether they'll get a meal that day. And they're the happiest, they're as happy as Larry, and they're full of the joy of the Lord. And that's always the case, isn't it? You hear it time and time again with people who have nothing, but they have the Lord. They have everything. That's not like us. We don't know we're born. What happens with us is the more you have, the less you appreciate it. And the more you have, the more you're tempted to trust in what you have. And the more you have, the more you want. And the more you long for things, status, relationships that you don't have but you want, the more dissatisfied and ungrateful you become with the Lord. And when you become dissatisfied and ungrateful with the Lord and what he's giving you, which is what you need and not necessarily want, the more you distance yourself from the Lord. Can you see the pattern? Now, there's nothing worse, and I used to hate to see it in my kids, when they're ungrateful for something, and especially when it costs, and you give it them, and uh, uh, well, you know, why didn't you get this? Ooh, there's nothing worse, is there? Well, I'll tell you what, God hates that a hundred times more than I do. God hates the sin of ingratitude. We shall see a bit more about this next week. That's why the fire came, and in verse 10, Moses heard the people of every family, every family, Wailing. In, the curiosity is, I, I'd like to have been a fly on the wall or the tent just to hear what the wailing was like, because it sounds really extreme. Each at the entrance to his tent. And the Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses, the leader, was troubled. Because instead of being grateful for God's provision, and they're only three days in, they're already blaming Moses, and by proxy, they're blaming God for it. And Moses hears their moaning, and then he blames God. Verse 11, he asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? You know, sometimes when there's trouble, it's not about you. It's actually about somebody else. But sometimes we project it all onto ourselves, as Moses did. And he says later on, what have I done? What, what is it that I... And, you know, I think he's appealing his innocence, fair enough. But sometimes we blame ourselves or we think something's about us when it's not. Stop it. <laughs> sometimes that's not the issue. It's not about you. It's not always about you. Someone's not talking to you. You think, so, you, you, sorry, somebody's sort of been, perhaps been in a hurry and they've kind of rushed off or something and you think... Oh, 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 why did they do that? What have they got against me? Nothing, they've just rushed off in a hurry. <laughs> Don't do it. I've done it, you've done it. The trouble is with this, you can see this pattern that moaning and discontent spreads very quick, rapidly. It starts with the rabble, then every family is wailing, and then Moses is moaning. You and I, when we begin to think on things that cause us to be discontent with the present, be careful who you tell. Don't pass it on to others. An ungrateful heart is a serious sin. Keep it to yourself. Or maybe just, well, we'll see in a minute. Sometimes 
we act like spoilt brats before our gracious Heavenly Father. And soon the whole congregation, if we continue to act and say those things, the whole congregation begins to become discontent and dissatisfied. And then suddenly God's kindness and God's love isn't enough anymore for the whole flock. That's what happened with Israel. Moses hears it and even he blames God. I don't think it was him blaming God for his provision, but for him having to bear the burden of an ungrateful, dissatisfied people. Because Moses is illustrating sometimes what it's like to be a leader, a leader's burden. Because Moses, as most leaders at some point or another, is now feeling out of his depth. Verse 11, he asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I con- He gets sarcastic with God now, but it's very cheeky. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers? It's all God's fault, of course. Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. come to the end of his tether he can't cope on his own anymore he's at the very end of his resources and he can't take any more of this disgruntled congregation to put it in our terms leaders sometimes go through that three days ago it's funny how this can escalate three days ago Everyone was on board. Three days later, it's mayhem. And he's saying to God, I didn't sign up to this. I didn't expect this. And now he thinks God is treating him unfairly too. That God is asking way too much of him. And Moses here is close to the edge. He's desperate. That's why he's lashing out a little too. But he's being honest. And he knows that if he has to carry on bearing all this trouble for much longer, he'll fail miserably, he'll end up falling in a heap and dribbling in the corner. He's got to the point where he wants out at this stage. He sees death suddenly as attractive. Verse 15. If this is how you are going to treat me, talking to God, put me to death right now. If I've found favor in your eyes, kill me. Kill me, And do not let me face my own ruin. A fear of what's coming next. He can't cope. He thinks he's going to collapse. He thinks that's the end. I wonder if you've been there as a leader of any ministry or just having trouble with certain people or if you're a pastor or you have been a pastor and you get to this stage where you just want to give it all up and walk away. I have. I know how it hurts. It's normal, it's natural. It's not always your fault either. (laughs) It's often the way we are. But let me just encourage you to be careful what you say to your leaders and actually how you say it. Because we're only human and we can't provide all your needs. Only God can do that. Your wife can't, your husband can't, your pastor certainly can't. But be careful with others what you say about them too. If you're discontent with one of us or any leaders, either keep it to yourself and let it go or come and tell us. Don't go to somebody else, it spreads. Discontent spreads. Many churches end up ruined because one person moaned to another about another. They passed it on, they passed it on. There's suddenly this very quickly, this attitude across the whole place. But Moses did the right thing here. He was under pressure. The people were against him. He even thought God was against him. But who does he go to? God. He goes straight to God. Now, he know, he, he's been out of order as well. But instead of moaning to anyone else, 
He goes to God and moans at him. You know, I'd rather moan at God than anybody else. He pours out his heart to the Lord. He admits he can't go on unless God does something. The Psalms are full of this, aren't they? Really dark. Well, one psalm, which is so, so good if you're utterly depressed and you can't see any hope, and it, it, there's nothing good about it, and it finishes with the darkness is my closest friend, and yet somehow the Holy Spirit saw it to put it in that psalm to comfort those who saw no light because he knew what it was like for them, and he was with them. If you're going to have a moan, if you're going to have a rant, Rant at the Lord. I used to have a terrible, terrible anger problem. And I used to just rant when I was on my own in the car. I used to rant like this. And then you come to the traffic lights and people, <laughs> is that, is that nutcase? And I went on at the Lord for ages. But it, A, it helped. And B, he was very kind. And C, I don't have that problem half as much as I used to. If you're needing to vent your frustration, anger, your weakness or your sorrow, go first to the Father, please. You'll save yourself and a lot of other people needless scars. And lastly, there we see God's gracious response. Verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials, not just anybody, among the people. I will come down and speak with you there. And I will take of the spirit that's on you and put the spirit on you them and they will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone what an incredible response to somebody who's angry insulting and sarcastic it's amazing because the lord is always and always will be the best listener and he already understands but he wants to hear it from you he is the wonderful counselor he is patient he is slow to anger and abounding in love. When his anger comes up, Moses comes and appeals to him and he stops. He's abounding in love. He'd rather love than get angry. And if you share your burdens and your moans and your wailings with him, he will give you strength. And he'll send others to help. So often that happens. Or he'll give you more of his spirit or both. But you can be guaranteed you will get through it if you go to him, lean on him, and see what he will do. If that's you, or if that ever has been you, maybe now you're weighed down, you're heavy with something, refocus. Get your eyes off yourself. Stop thinking if only. Stop being discontent with what's happened. Tell him all about it. Some people, they come to me and they tell me absolutely everything about the problem, and that's brilliant, and it's a real privilege. But then I say, have you told the Lord about this? Because you really need to. He's the one that can ultimately help. I've only pointed to him anyway. Give him all your troubles, your burdens, your heavy heart, and he will swap it for his heart, his burden. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, let me finish with this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I, not somebody else, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. I'm not going to strike you down. I'm not going to punish you. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what? You can get through absolutely anything if you rest in Jesus. You really can. It's not that the pain doesn't go away. It's not that there isn't some anxiety, but you can get through it. Step by step. Resting, trusting, looking to him and not yourself or others. Amen. Let's sing.